Greta Thunberg, one of the other horsemen of the environmental apocalypse. Yeah, well, it's funny that people didn't notice right away that she is a young girl with pigtails because that's what Stalin and Mao and Hitler all used young girls with pigtails in their photographs. It's all been well documented. I don't know what the pigtails has to do with it, but dictators seems almost always use children as a front to make it look as though they're nice. There's all kinds of photographs of her on trains with the head of Greenpeace and, of course, Al Gore, and the list is endless. And her speeches are written for her, obviously, and she doesn't know anything much about climate change or science. So what is she then? She's simply a tool. She is not a wise person telling us what we should be doing. She is being used by Hollywood actors and phony politicians like Al Gore, none of whom actually have any science. Lessons on oral sex, how to choke your partner safely, and 72 genders. This is what passes for relationships and sex education in British schools. Across the country, children are being subjected to lessons that are age-inappropriate, extreme, sexualizing and inaccurate, often using resources from unregulated organisations that are actively campaigning to undermine parents. This is not a victory for equality, it is a catastrophe for childhood. Will my right honourable friend honour his commitment to end inappropriate sex education by commissioning an independent inquiry into the nature and extent of this safeguarding scandal. Can I say I I share my honourable friend's concerns and thank her for her work in this area. Uh, That's why I've asked the Department for Education to ensure that schools are not teaching inappropriate or contested content in RSHE. Our priority should always be the safety and well-being of children, and schools should also make curriculum content and materials available to parents. Uh, As a result of all of this, we are bringing forward a review of RSHE statutory guidance and will will start our consultation as soon as possible. So today we're going to talk about all these antennas. Now what's interesting is this is the 1890s Los Angeles, right? And look at all those antennas. You think they were gathering lightning? It doesn't make any sense because then the whole place would burn down. But they're all over the place. Now what's interesting is you see this design all over the world and even Harvard is asking what is in these and what do they do? Could they be brass balls with mercury in them? Then we look at some other designs and we see that there's usually an antenna on top with some mercury below it some copper, granite and quartz, and these were actually energy generators. Sounds almost like they were getting free energy. Maybe that's why they also removed all the pipe organs as well. And if we take it a step further, we can see this one, same thing, antenna at the top, mercury cell below, harmonizer, frequency, and energy storage. Almost like one big battery that's gathering energy the entire time and then providing everybody with free electricity. Then if we take it one step further and we look at mercury right here and you put it in front of a voltmeter and you begin to spin it, you create voltage. It's almost like those were brass balls filled with mercury that would somehow cause a spin which would result in electric. Now if you take copper and do the exact same thing, you don't get any voltage. But the mercury, you get voltage. Something to think about. I'm going to simplify another conspiracy for you once again. Okay, so let's say you're BlackRock. You're in control of 40% of the investable assets globally. You're heavily invested in literally every aspect of life. The food industry, medical industry, weapon industry, transportation, the media, everything. By the way, this isn't a conspiracy. This is public data that anyone can find. So once you have all this power, you need to increase demand in order to keep the economy going. What are you going to do? Well, 
you're gonna create a crisis. Because you cannot have a 90 billion dollar weapon industry without a war. You cannot have demand for green energy without a climate crisis. You cannot sell a vaccine without a pandemic. And you cannot create media traffic without drama. It's an entire ecosystem controlled from the upper class and it's no coincidence we're in a perpetual state of crisis. Of course, celebrating over it and touting about how great it is. But of course, there's the other angle of this participation rate. Explain that to us and why we need to look at that. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, we have, uh, we're in a very good position to uh, tell, talk about what's going on in the job market. We work with a lot of Fortune 1000 organizations, and we get a good pulse on what's ramping and um, areas of growth. We also work with quite a few staffing firms, and they're kind of the first ones to experience that growth. We're seeing tremendous... How about new? America, take a good look at your beloved candidates. They're nothing but hideous space reptiles. Oh. It's true. We are aliens. But what are you going to do about it? It's a two-party system. You have to vote for one of us. He's right. This is a two-party system. Well, I believe I'll vote for a third-party candidate. Go ahead. Throw your vote away. <laughs> All hail President K. Scotland has just admitted to chopping down 16 million trees. And this is all to make way for the so-called fucking green wind energy farms. Now, I'm not sure if I've missed something here. But don't trees play a crucial role in supporting life on Earth? Because last time I fucking checked, they absorbed carbon dioxide. They release oxygen through something called photosynthesis. They are helping to regulate the planet's climate. And in turn, providing breathable fucking air. Trees, they also provide habitat and food for various species. Contribute to soil health, prevent erosion and support the water cycle by absorbing and releasing water. Trees, they also enhance biodiversity and contribute to a healthier environment overall. The trees were growing on public land and were chopped down so that that land could be used for wind turbines. Of course it fucking was. The omission was made by Scotland's Rural Affairs Secretary, Marie Goujon. And if I've not pronounced your name right, Marie, oh well. She's a member of the ruling left-wing Scottish National Party. She estimated that 15.7 million trees have been cut down since 2000 on land currently managed by FLS, Forestry and Land Scotland. To meet the goals of the climate agenda, the equivalent of more than 1,700 trees were felled per day. You couldn't make this shit up, could you? Now, don't panic. Because they've also said that where woodland is removed in association with development, developers will generally be expected to provide compensatory planting in order to avoid a net loss of woodland. But guess what, guys? They have been unable to provide any evidence of such replanting occurring whatsoever. Absolutely fucking nonsensical. We hand over our hard-earned tax dollars to these people and then we go out and line the streets and watch them spend it and instead of rioting we just stand there and wave flags at them, fawning over multi-millionaires whose only achievement was being born into the right family. The right family that is full of fucking wrong -uns and paedophiles and Nazi apologists. Pampered arseholes. Literally, they have a footman to wipe their arse for them at the taxpayer's expense. This is Holland Park in London, one of the most beautiful streets in London because of all the trees that line it. Uh, and these are trees that the Mayor of London wanted to pull down um, to make way for a cycle lane. Well, he can fuck off. I mean, the man's obviously deranged. 
You can't pull trees down so that people can cycle. I mean, I know that cycle lanes now are seen as the single most important thing in the world by all those lunatics with five hardened bananas on their head and a little GoPro, but they don't fuck off, they're not. I was just coming just now into London on the A40, where they'd taken one of the lanes away to make a cycle lane. Massive traffic jam resulting from it. And stuck in it is an ambulance. Someone is dying of a heart attack somewhere up in Acton. Ambulance can't get there because they're building a cycle lane. We live in absurd times. Absurd. In Hyde Park, they took half the road away to make a cycle lane, even though there was already a cycle lane running parallel to it 30 feet away. So now there's a choice of cycle lane when you're in Hyde Park. Why? If when you get to work and you cycle there and you need to make up for the calories that you've lost by cycling and you have an avocado that's been flown from, I don't know, the other side of the world, you'd be better off environmentally going to work in a Humvee. And this information is not coming from my head. It's coming from the Guardian newspaper. That's where I found it. The Guardian will tell you that cycling means you have to eat to get the calories you need to ride a bicycle. Is anyone paying any attention to any of this? No, they're not. We must have cycle lanes. It's good for the environment. No, it isn't. It isn't. Oh, and here's another thing. The cycle lane that we're going to build along here, OK? Four and a bit miles, 42 million pounds. That's what they were quoted. In fuck off, I do see you can't charge 40. That's 10 million pounds a mile for just painting a little bicycle on the road. Who was your greatest love and why did you fall in love with them? My greatest love was John. He's my soulmate. Always was, always will be. I love him forever. We, um, he's just like a part of me. We didn't think the same way. We had different personalities, so it wasn't that. He's my soulmate forever. There'd never be another person like John. We completed each other. We got married in 1950. And I have a story to tell you there. Please. John had three sisters, one of whom we got very close, so we double dated. I don't know who said it, but somebody said, why don't we have a double wedding? And we did. How did you like that? Oh, it was great. You didn't hear it all yet. You wait. <laughs> okay, let me hear it. <laughs> and we had a double honeymoon. <laughs> and we borrowed John's father's car to go. <laughs> We were so poor. Do you remember when he asked you out? I do. Remember, I'm 94. My memory, okay. Let, <laughs> let me stop and think. We would go to a 50-cent movie in Charleroi. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deal. It was sure a deal for him because he didn't have any money. <laughs> it was very exciting. I was in love. I don't know. Have you ever been in love? Yeah, yeah. So you know that feeling. Yeah, Yeah, it course. just goes all through you, right? <laughs> of course. From head to toes. Yes, yeah. it does. What's your name? Wilma. Hunter. Hunter. Did you ever hear a silly story like that? That's a beautiful story. We had a beautiful life, Hunter. We really did.